I want you to turn here tonight to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. You know, some people might think I labor things. I do not labor things. I want to tell you, we do a series to cover everything thoroughly. And I want to tell you, I am very concise and precise in the messages that make up a series. Some may not think that. And do you know what? I learned an awful lot of lessons along the way. Some years ago, I preached a series on Lot's journey to Sodom, a very important series. I couldn't get off it. There's only several messages. And do you know about three messages in that series, a family in this church who all seem to be very rooted and loving Christ. The mother and the daughter approached me and the mother jokingly said to the daughter, oh, I said to my daughter, I sure hope he's not preaching on, so on Lot's journey to Sodom again this morning. And they laughed. And you know what? My heart smote me and I went, oh boy, maybe next week, something different. You know, all week, the Lord wouldn't let me go in a different direction. And not for the next three weeks, I think it was. I couldn't get off this. And in my mind and heart, I was apologetic. But you see, I'm walking after the Spirit. I want to be led of the Spirit. But here's supposedly genuine believers who are mocking, saying, oh, no, not that again. Do you know that entire series was for that family? That entire family was led back to Sodom within a very short period of time to make wreck and ruin of their souls. You see, I've learned to take the leading of the Holy Spirit very seriously and the Word of God very seriously. So that's my justification for spending time on a series. You know what? I do not want to miss the mark. And I believe tonight in this series, this well could be the most important message in this series so far. Romans chapter 1. And we're in part 10 here tonight on this series, Penal Substitution. Maybe the most important truth I'm going to preach in this series. Absolutely the most important truth. But probably one of the major truths of the entire Bible that almost never gets preached in the church. That's disaster. This is my message tonight. God's gift of perfect righteousness. And you know where I'm going. Romans chapter 1, verse 17. Sorry, let me go back. Verse 15. Just three short verses I want to give to you here tonight as we preach. Verse 15. So as much as it is in me, is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. And he's writing to Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Sorry, the Greek. For therein, and I want you to notice this very carefully tonight. For therein, in the gospel that he's not ashamed of. Why is he not ashamed? For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Let's pray together. Father, we trust, we lean upon the instruction of your Holy Spirit. We need him here tonight. We need him to be the teacher, the instructor, the one that you said would lead us into all truth. You said he would be the paraclete, the one that would come alongside us, that would exhort us, that would speak to us, that would lead us. And we rely upon him absolutely because you told us to trust him as a teacher. And my God, we know that it's the Holy Spirit that gave us this Bible. It's the Holy Spirit who inspired every single word, letter, comma, full stop. And Lord God, we do trust him and this book that he compiled 
that he authored, that he inspired, that he breathed out through holy men of God. And Father, I pray for this wonderful truth that you'd open our eyes, that you'd anoint your word, that you'd bless it, that you'd guide it to our hearts, that you'd give us understanding, insight, wisdom, counsel, everything that we need. Father, radically change our lives tonight with this central truth, this radical truth, this foundational truth, this beginning truth, this vital truth. And oh God, we need you to teach us, oh God. We need you to bless us tonight that this truth will fill the city of Limerick. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. My message, part 10, God's gift of perfect righteousness. In part nine, we dealt with the exchange covenant. Do you remember that? From 1 Samuel chapter 18. Listen again, the verse that we preached on in part nine. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because they loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David. And so we saw that Jonathan was a type of Christ. David was a type of you and I, a real Christian. And this robe that Jonathan took off and gave to David as a free gift that represented who he was. It was actually a picture of the robe of righteousness. And I painted that picture. Then I told you, we're going to go into scripture, into doctrine, into the New Testament, into the teaching of the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans. Because I gave you a picture. Now we're going to give you substance. And oh boy, what a, a lot of substance. If you swallow this and digest this tonight, you're a good one. I want to tell you because I'm gonna cram truth into you tonight. And I don't apologize. If it goes over your head, go back and listen again and get on your knees and listen to it again, on your knees praying, saying, Lord, open my heart because this can radically change your life. I don't care if you're saved 50 years or you're saved one night or you're not saved tonight. This truth can radically change you. This in the Old Testament is Jonathan's robe given to David. But in the New Testament, it's Christ's robe given to you and that I. Listen again to one of the parables of Jesus Christ in Matthew 22 and verse 11. This Jesus speaking about the parable of the wedding feast. And when the king came in to see his guests, he saw that there was a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, having not a wedding garment? And he, the man, was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Notice this man responded to the invitation. He heard, he believed, he responded. He wants to be there. Understand this. He wants to actually be there in the wedding feast. He responds to the invitation. Notice as well, he loves the company. He loves to be with these folk who are there. And also know that he looks forward to the meal that's going to be laid out. But you know what? He got cast out into an eternal hell because he didn't have the robe on, the right garment, the wedding garment. Do you know what I'm preaching to you about is the wedding garment, not only Jonathan's robe, but the wedding garment that you're going to have to have to be at the wedding feast. In my message tonight, God's gift of perfect righteousness, I have six points. I may not reach the sixth, but I'll certainly give you five. And this is my first point. Listen very carefully to these points. They're so, so important. Because I'm dealing with one of the most important, life-changing truths that ought to make you happy. And if you don't have this robe, it ought to make you very sad. 
But as a believer, you ought to be skipping and dancing and shouting and rejoicing tonight at this truth. Number one, God demands perfect righteousness. He doesn't suggest it. You know, all across the church, hey, God doesn't expect us to be perfect. Don't we hear it? No one's perfect. We're all sinners. You know what? That's an utter contestant with the truth of the Bible. I want to tell you, anyone who knows the real God knows he demands perfect righteousness. You know, our God is a holy God. He searches out every deed. He sees every action, every thought, every word. He doesn't excuse it. He doesn't ignore it. Listen to what the Bible says in the book of Romans. You see, do you know why I'm dealing with the book of Romans? Because a man who denied penal substitution, a teacher, a mature leader, a prophet. Do you know one of the things he said about this truth, penal substitution, as he dropped it in the bin? He said, it is nowhere taught in the book of Romans. Never mind the New Testament. Do you know what I say? This truth of our sin being placed on Christ and his righteousness being placed on us is all through the book of Romans, all through it. I can take you through every chapter, every verse and preach it. It, it is actually clearly and explicitly taught here. But I want you to see in this first point, God demands perfect righteousness. In Romans chapter three and verse 10, it says, as it is written, in other words, in the Old Testament, there is none righteous. Notice that. No one is righteous. You're not born righteous and then you sin and become unrighteous. That's not true. You are all unrighteous. There's never been outside of Christ one righteous man. Those who teach sinless perfection and that the sin nature is uprooted. Some of them actually teach we're born righteous, we're born innocent, we're born sinless. That's a false teaching. Because you know what my Bible clearly says? None is righteous. Neither this is right or they are right. But they both can't be right. My Bible says it is written. There is none righteous. What is righteous? To be in a right standing with God, in a right relationship with God. That's what righteousness is. And you know what? God demands perfect righteousness. And yet what does the Bible say? None is righteous. Not one man. Not one woman. In fact, when you go to the book of Romans from chapter 1 to chapter 3, we read all about man's need of righteousness. In these three chapters, God is laying out man's sin, man's depravity. Man doesn't understand. Man doesn't do good. Man doesn't fear God. None of them seek after God. None is righteous. None is in right standing with God. That's why the wrath of God is there. So in these three or four initial chapters of Romans... The Holy Spirit is conveying through Paul that none is righteous. Man is bankrupt of righteousness. You don't have this robe of righteousness. In your own condition, you have filthy garments on. I don't care if it's the nuns across the road, the little priest in the center of the city, the little granny. Well, the little grannies in this city aren't much to speak about. They blaspheme more than any soldier in the British Army. I want to tell you that their mouths are filthy and they're liars. And yet they say, we're righteous, we go to mass. I want to tell you, none is righteous. None is righteous. And you know what? The Bible states this very, very clearly. What does it mean to be righteous? It means to be innocent. For God to look upon you and say, you're innocent. There's nothing I can find wrong with you. There's no broken relationship. You're holy. You're pure. You know, if I look for righteousness from your standpoint, I might call you righteous. But when I look from God's perspective, you're not dealing with God or a church or a preacher you're not dealing with that. We're talking about God. None is righteous. This is his word, his statement. He says, none is righteous. No, not one. You see, there is 
No one who's reached God's standard. None. And God does have a standard that he expects, that he demands. He's not playing games. When he says, keep my commandments, he's not joking. It's not a suggestion. When he says, if you disobey my commandments, there's consequence. It's not a joke. He's not saying, try your best. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. And yet it's all through the church. Sure, we'll try our best. God understands I'm under grace. Wherever did they get that? Not in the Bible. Not with the God of the Bible. You see, he has a standard. And it says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If you've sinned, you are not righteous before God. To sin means you've missed the mark. God says, this is the mark. This is the target. This is what you're to be. And you know what the Bible says? All have sinned. All missed the mark. God pointed out what he wanted. Righteousness. Perfect righteousness. Absolute righteousness. What does the law say? It says, keep all the commandments. Do you know what the law reveals? If anyone could keep it all, he would come right up to God's standards. And I'll show you it very shortly. But the fact is, all have sinned. It says also in Ecclesiastes verse seven, or chapter 7, verse 20, For there is not a just man in the earth. Just is to be righteous. What does the Bible say? There's not a just man in the entire earth. Not one. All have sinned. This is preparation to bring you to God's righteousness. That doeth good and sinneth not. Not one man. It also says in Nahum chapter 1 verse 3, the Lord is slow to anger, great in power. Then listen to what he says next. See, we, we want him to be slow to anger. We want him to be great in power, but most don't want the next part. Listen to what it says. And will not at all acquit the wicked. He's great in power. He is slow to anger. But he will never, ever, ever acquit the wicked. In other words, he'll never cancel out your sin and just say, you're forgiven. Never. He will never let you off the hook. A guilty man, he'll never let them off the hook. This trash teaching that God could just forgive you without the cross is heresy. This Bible actually says it. He won't acquit. You know what they're teaching? Oh, it's the character of God to love, to forgive. He'll just acquit you. No, he will not. The Bible actually says he won't. Then in Exodus 34, 7, it says he w that this great God will by no means clear the guilty. So if you're looking for a God who just cancels everything out because he's love and he wants to forgive you and he's a nice God, you're looking in the wrong place. He'll never just acquit you because you ask for it. He'll never just let you off the hook because he's a loving God. That will never, ever, ever happen. You see, God demands perfect righteousness. He loves man. He pursues man, but he won't just ignore sin. Never, ever, ever. Something has to happen. In Romans 3.26, it says, to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness. Notice what he's saying. To declare, to begin to talk about the righteousness of God, his righteousness. Why? That he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. So notice here, why is the righteousness of God revealed? proclaimed, or why am I preaching? I'm preaching the righteousness of God tonight. Why do I do that? Why does God give us a message to proclaim his righteousness? You know why? That he will be just. Not only just, but the justifier of him that believeth. You know what it says in Romans? He justifieth the ungodly. Now, how can a God who demands perfect righteousness, he won't acquit you of your sin, how can he be just? How can he forgive you? How can you be justified as if you'd never, ever sinned in your entire life? To stand before God innocent, 
perfect, accepted. How can that happen? Do you know what? It says we need to preach the righteousness of God. Notice that. We've got to preach the righteousness of God. Why? So that God is just. Because when you preach the righteousness of God, you, you suddenly see that God hasn't compromised his holiness. He is a pure God. And yet he justifies people like you and I. He makes you righteous. He makes you perfect. And yet he's still just. How can he possibly do that? Point two, two kinds of righteousness. Number one, God demands perfect righteousness. Number two, two kinds of righteousness. Most Christians don't even know there's two different kinds of righteousness revealed in the Bible and revealed in the book of Romans. And here tonight, you're either living by one kind of righteousness or the other kind of righteousness. And I want you to ask yourself, what sort of righteousness are you wearing tonight? Turn in your Bible for a second to Romans chapter 10. Very important scripture here, Romans chapter 10. And I'm going to show you something very, very important about two different kinds of righteousness. You see, here's Paul the Apostle who begins writing in chapter 1. Now he's come down to chapter 10. Listen to what he says. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. So he's dealing with salvation. I desire you to be saved. You Jews that are living by the law, the Ten Commandments, by Moses, by morality, by trying your best. He says, I want you to be saved. He's talking about very moral, very religious. These are the sorts of people who get a little knife out and start cutting up their herbs to make sure they're tithing okay. One for God, nine for me. These men go to bed late and get up very early because they're pernickety. They are working hard. They are striving to keep all the commandments. What does Paul say to them? I desire that you be saved. I'm going to speak to you about real salvation. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God. Zeal doesn't mean a man's saved. You could be radically zealous and utterly wrong in your doctrine but not according to knowledge. Zealous, but they don't have the right knowledge. Do you realize how dangerous it is to have zeal, passion, fire, but not the correct knowledge? See, some people leave their head at the door. Never do that in this church. That's why I like you to have your Bibles. That's why I like you to check what I'm saying. That's why I like you to quiz and question if you need to or want to. Do you know what? You, if you do not have the correct knowledge, you'll destroy your life. You better make sure you have the right knowledge about the gospel and you understand the gospel. It's not just a thing of experience. It's a thing of knowledge and of truth. Verse 3, for they being ignorant. Now notice we're really getting into this now. I'm talking about two kinds of righteousness. Paul is an apostle, a Christian, born again. He used to be one of them. He's not anymore. So he's going to compare two different kinds of righteousness in verse 3. He's got a different righteousness than they are seeking after. Listen to what he says. For they, that is the Jews, who he wants to see saved, being ignorant of God's righteousness. So notice that's one kind of righteousness. God's righteousness. That's one. Do you know what he says? These Pharisees, these Jews who have the scriptures, they have the Bible. They say they descend from the faith of Abraham. They have the word of God. Do you know what he says? They are ignorant. Do you know what to be ignorant is? In your understanding, you don't even understand God's righteousness. Do you know I believe the church of our day is utterly ignorant of God's righteousness. That's why the pastors don't preach on it. That's why the teachers don't teach on it. That's why the prophets don't proclaim it. 
the righteousness of God. They go, what do you mean? Oh, God is righteous. It doesn't mean that. Oh, God is holy. It doesn't mean that. Do you know what it says? You Jews are ignorant. Intellectually, you're ignorant of this truth. The, God's righteousness or the righteousness of God. You don't even know this. You don't even understand this. Saints of God, do you understand God's righteousness? I mean, with your mind, have you studied it? Do you understand it? Because you know what? It's the most fundamental truth in the Bible. It's absolutely vital for thee being ignorant of God's righteousness. God's righteousness. What do they do? And going about to establish their own righteousness. That's the second kind of righteousness. There's God's righteousness or there's their righteousness. And if you're ignorant of God's righteousness, then do you know what you do? You embark on a very long, arduous journey concerning your own righteousness in order to be saved. That's why you get people in the church and one moment they're saved and the next minute they're not saved. They don't even know where they are. They don't even know about God's righteousness. You can't be saved without this. This is fundamental, foundational to salvation. It's an issue of salvation. If you don't know God's righteousness, and you may not know it intellectually, but you've come into it, okay? So and you're taught about it as you come into this. It says, they go about to establish their own righteousness. They're establishing their own righteousness, right standing before God. They are establishing it. They're working on it. I've got to strengthen this. I've got to make it strong. I've got to make it upright. I've got to make it correct. You know why? Because I've got to be right with God. And they embark on a whole journey their righteousness. Are you working on your righteousness tonight to be accepted by God, to be saved, to stand in his presence one day? Are you working hard? You will be worn out. Do you realize you'll have a mental breakdown? You'll go off the edge of the boat. You'll say, I can't do this. It's very, very intensive and hard work. Listen, it says, and have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. I wonder if you've submitted to the righteousness of God tonight. You know what it means to submit, to come under, to obey, to yield, to bend, to submit to the righteousness of God. See, they are not doing this. They are not submitting. They're trying to establish their own righteousness. They're working hard on their own righteousness and they haven't submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Their own righteousness is imperfect. It won't cover you. Your righteousness, I don't care how great your righteousness is, your goodness, your works, your obedience, I don't care how good it is. You know what? At best, it's imperfect in the sight of God. It won't cover you completely. Have you ever seen a tall man with a short bed cover. He can pull on it, stretch it, do whatever. Have you ever been in a bed? Some of you won't know what this is like and your feet is over the bottom of it. The bed's not the right length. That's nothing compared to our, your righteousness. You know what? People in the church are pulling their righteousness like a blanket. It won't cover you head to toe. You pull it this way, from your knees down, it's uncovered. You pull it down over your feet, your top is uncovered. And you know what? That's a very imperfect example. Your righteousness does not cover you. You're exposed, you're ashamed, you're naked. It won't keep you safe in the day of judgment. And so they're trying to establish their righteousness and they all this time, they're ignorant of God's righteousness and they don't submit to God's righteousness. And Paul is speaking to them, I want you to be saved. You're trying to be saved by your own righteousness. I want you to be saved by the righteousness of God. And then it says in verse five, for Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law. That's your righteousness, a righteousness which is of the law. 
but aren't I meant to keep the law? Aren't I meant to obey God? Aren't I meant to be holy? Yes, of course, but not for salvation. God never yet saved a holy man. Do you know I don't have any message? Well, I do have some messages, but not a message of salvation for the self-righteous. You know what Romans says? God only saves the ungodly. He makes ungodly men righteous. He can't save a righteous man. And there are no righteous men. So if a man thinks he's righteous and he's good and he's doing everything, you're excluded from salvation. Christ only saved an ungodly sinner. I'm talking about the point of salvation. You come as a sinner, bankrupt, unable to do anything. God can do something for you. If you submit, come under, bend the knee. That's where you begin. Christian, tonight, this is where your salvation begins. I can't change myself. I can't help myself. I can't clean myself. But I submit to you. I bow to you. I accept your righteousness. That's why, do you know on the night or the day or the morning or the afternoon you got saved? Do you, if you remember that point, you felt so clean. You didn't even understand all of this. Why do you think you felt clean? And go, for the first time in my life, I'm in a right relationship with God. It happened in one moment of time. How is that possible? You didn't even understand all the theology. But something happened to you. You know what? You bowed the knee going, I can't change myself. I can't help myself. So I just come to God. You may not have understood all this, but you threw yourself upon God and said, help me, forgive me, change me. Make me right with God. And it happened. You know what you've done? You submitted to the righteousness of God. Moses describeth the righteousness, which is of the law, that if a man which doeth those things shall live by them, but the righteous, but the righteousness which is of faith. So notice again, it's either a righteousness which is by faith or a righteousness of the law. They're the two different kinds of righteousness. Did you get your righteousness by faith, by believing? Or did you get your righteousness by working hard? I'm talking about a robe of righteousness. There's two radically different kinds of righteousness. Then he says in verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart, this is the faith, believe in the heart that God hath raised him, Jesus, from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So this is real salvation he's talking about. For with the heart man believeth, Unto righteousness. Do you hear what I just said? You should underline this in your Bible. It never gets preached. This is real salvation. For with the heart, not the hand. With the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. When you believe you're righteous, unto righteousness. You actually become righteous. Two kinds of righteousness, either by the law, by works, by your efforts, you accomplish it. it like the Jews, that's what they were doing. And you don't submit to God's righteousness, but there is another kind. And it's by faith where when you believe in Christ that he died, that he suffered, that he buried, that he rose again for you. And when you believe on him, you know what happened when you believed on him? You believed unto righteousness. You were brought into the righteousness of God. You were literally, you didn't even understand this. And you want to know why your sins were forgiven and you felt so good and you're reconciled to God and you know that you're right. You don't even understand all of this. All you know is I'd been brought in to the person of Christ. Yes, you've been brought into his righteousness. This is a radical, life-changing experience. And so we believe unto righteousness. This is where you begin. The night you first put your faith in Christ, you're made righteous. You're brought into the righteousness of God. 
It's a dynamic thing, and yet we don't preach it. We don't preach a faith that brings us into righteousness, makes us righteous, and we go on a lifetime pursuit of trying to hard, work hard to stay right with God or to create our own righteousness. I can show you these two kinds of righteousness all through the Bible. Philippians chapter 3 and 8. Listen to what Paul says again. That I may win Christ. You see, this truth makes you a holy man or woman. I'm a preacher of holiness and of righteous words and righteous deeds and thinking right. But you know something I found in life? When you have this truth right, you get holy Christians. And if you walk into a church and they're saying, you don't need to give up the drink or the drugs or the sex or your worldly music. You can dress, you ladies can dress like the world. That's okay, that's fine. I guarantee it's because they don't know this righteousness of God. Because there's something about the righteousness of God so radical that it makes you want to be holy and live holy and walk purely before the Lord. So Paul says in Philippians 3 and 8, that I may win Christ. He's pursuing Christ. He's running hard after Christ. So it doesn't diminish holiness. It didn't in Paul. Paul's preaching this truth. Verse 9, and be found in him. That is Jesus not having mine own righteousness. Do you see that he's talking about a coming day? I am going to be found in Christ, not having mine own righteousness. Mine, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, through putting faith in Jesus, and then he tells you what it is. The righteousness, which is of God, by faith. Do you see how clear this is? Two kinds of righteousness. Point three, God's righteousness. I'm taking you step by step. I want you to understand this. Point three, God's righteousness. Look at Romans chapter 3, 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested You know, the word manifested there means to render apparent, to appear, to see it, to declare it, to open it, to make it public to everyone. What's he saying? Now. In other words, since Christ died on the cross, now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest. What is the righteousness of God without the law? This is a righteousness you cannot have by keeping all the law. Do you honestly think you can keep all the law and actually through holiness of life be perfect enough to be accepted by God? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You know, your holy life is never the ground of your acceptance with God. Never forget this. If you walk with Christ 50 years, and I'm speaking from experience, I started walking with them when I was four and a half years old and I walked with them. I met with them. I fellowshiped with them. And for all these years, this has been the most vital truth of my Christian life. I keep coming back to it. And believe me, this will restore every area of your life. It'll make you live right and walk right and seek right and choose right. When this truth is clear, you walk the world in white. You absolutely do. And so it says this truth is manifest, a righteousness which isn't by the law, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. This is a teaching for the truth, the righteousness of God, manifest, shown forth, preached and proclaimed. And you know what he says? But it's in the law and the prophets. In other words, in the Old Testament, it talks about this righteousness of God. Did you think this is only a New Testament thing? Do you think it's only for the Christians under the new covenant in the church? Don't you know this was also taught in the Old Testament? In fact, I'll tell you, it's been taught since the Garden of Eden. What was in the Garden of Eden? Two trees. Two trees are presented to mankind at the beginning. Your choice, which tree are you going to live by? Are you going to live by the tree of life or the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? 
You're presented with two trees, two covenants, two different kinds of righteousness. One of these is righteousness by faith. The other is a righteousness by law. Keep all the commandments and you'll live. Adam and Eve are given one command and they broke it. Couldn't even keep that. And they were innocent. They weren't perfect. They were innocent in the garden. And so Paul goes on and says, being witnessed in the law and prophets, the law. Do you know what the law is? The first five books of the law. Go to Genesis, you'll find this teaching. Go to Exodus. Look into Leviticus. You know what you're going to find? This teaching of the righteousness of God, which isn't by the law. You know, most in the church have the idea. In the Old Testament, men were saved by law. Who told you that? No one has ever been saved by law. Not Abel, not Abraham, not David, not Nehemiah. No one. In the Old Testament, you're saved the same way as a New Testament Christian. Exactly the same way. And so it says being witnessed by the law and the prophets, all the prophets. Don't you know Isaiah talked about this? Don't you know Jeremiah talked about this? Don't you know this righteousness, which is a free gift in Christ? Don't you know they taught this all through the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi? This is taught two kinds of righteousness. What are you going to be saved by? And then he goes on to say here in verse 22, chapter 3, 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Do you realize those saved in the Old Testament were saved by faith through the righteousness of God? By faith in Jesus. Oh, but Brother Keith, Jesus wasn't there. And they didn't have a clear picture of the cross. Didn't we do a whole message on Isaiah 53? And it's more clear than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John put together. A vision, clear vision of the cross in Isaiah. Presented before you. Manifested. What does it mean to manifest? To render apparent. To appear. To declare. To make it really obvious. Notice the righteousness of God is not... He's not talking in the book of Romans about the character of God. He is righteous. He's absolutely righteous. But this isn't talking about the character of God. Neither is it talking about the deeds or the works of God. They are righteous, perfectly righteous. But it's not talking about that. Do you know what this righteousness of God is? It is the gift of God's righteousness to sinners when they get saved. It's a righteousness that comes from God. He is the author of it. He is the creator of this righteousness. He has to give it to you. And as soon as you receive it, instantly you're made right with God. You go from being a sinner to being a saint by this righteousness of God. But he has to give it to you. You see, this actually comes in the gospel and is presented to sinners. How are they going to be saved if they don't hear about the righteousness of God? That it comes by faith, through grace, not by their works at all. It is witnessed by the prophets. Listen to the Old Testament, Jeremiah 23 and 6. In the days of Judah, in, in his days, Judah shall be saved. And Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called. So it's on to Israel and Judah. They're going to be saved one day in the future. How? Well, I'll give you his name. The Lord, our righteousness. This was preached to Israel. Do you realize there's a one coming, a Messiah, and he's going to be called your righteousness as an entire nation? Or listen to Jeremiah 33 and 16. In those days shall Judah be saved. He gave them a lot of hints, didn't he? not going to be saved by your works it's going to be in a man and he'll be called your righteousness and Jerusalem Jerusalem shall dwell safely and this is the name wherewith they shall be called the Lord our righteousness Isaiah 45 24 surely surely they shall say in the Lord 
have I righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come, and all that are increased against him shall be ashamed. In the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory. I'm only picking out a few verses that no one ever usually spends much time on. I can give you hundreds, if not thousands, of verses like this. It says in Romans chapter 4, verse uh, 5, But to him that worketh not, it's not your works that make you righteous or accepted or put you in a right relationship with God. It's not within your power. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. God looks down, you go, I put my faith in Christ that he'll save me a sinner. God looks down, sees that faith and says, you know what? I count that as righteousness. My righteousness. I see your faith. Oh, that's easy easy believism. No, it is not. You know I don't preach easy believism. I'm preaching you the real gospel of Jesus Christ. Point four. Christ's perfect righteousness. I just told you about God's righteousness. That statement, God's righteousness. What is it? It's a gift when you get born again. You get given it. Now I want to deal with Christ's perfect righteousness. I'm going deeper. Look back at Romans chapter 1 verse 16 where we read when we opened. Romans 1 verse 16. And this Paul speaking, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. He's speaking about the gospel. What is the message of the gospel? What is the gospel? It's the good news, the gospel of salvation. It's the evangel, the message that you get given to get born again. So he says, I'm not ashamed, embarrassed of the gospel. I don't change it. I don't leave bits out. I don't add. I don't twist it. I don't withhold it, I open it. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. That's why I'm not ashamed. It's the power of God. The real gospel has power. It'll change your life. Can you imagine? I'm an ungodly sinner bound by sin. And suddenly you believe in Christ and you go, I'm free. I didn't change my mind. I couldn't have changed my own heart. But suddenly I want to do things differently. How did this happen? It's the power of God. The gospel has power if you simply believe it. And then listen, this verse, verse 17, so important. He's speaking about the contents of the gospel message. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Do you see Paul is saying here, the gospel has power. Because in it is revealed, and the word revealed means to take the cover off. It's the word akapalupto, which is in Revelation. Revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Take the cover off Jesus. You you know, that's what the book of Revelation is all about. It's not about Antichrist. The book of Revelation is the uncovering of Jesus. You'll see the real Jesus in the book of Revelation. And so it says, that in the real gospel is revealed. The cover is taken off the real gospel. You know what you hear? The righteousness of God is preached in the real gospel. If you hear a gospel, it says you have to keep yourself saved. You have to work very hard. And, and you're going to have to strive to be accepted by God. That's a foreign gospel. The first day I got born again, I was made righteous. I received a gift. God saw my little childlike faith, saying, forgive me, reconcile me, make me right. And he says, you know what? I've got a wonderful gift for you because you believed in my son, Jesus Christ. You don't earn this. You get given it. This is the gospel within the real gospel is revealed. This gift of the righteousness of God. Then in Romans chapter 5, 19, it says, and this is a very important scripture. This is why I called this fourth point, Christ's perfect righteousness. It's not just God's righteousness. What is God's righteousness? It is Christ's perfect righteousness. And it's proved in this verse, Romans 5, 19. 
For as by one man's disobedience, who was that man? That was Adam. Who sinned first, Adam or Eve? Eve did, the woman did. But do you realize Eve's sin did not destroy mankind? All the sisters are very happy now. It was the man who messed it all up. How could Eve sin first and the fall didn't happen? And straight after Adam sins and the fall happens and all of creation falls. Do you realize it was man pulled it down? It was man's sin. And here in Romans 5, 19, it says, for by one man's disobedience, it's talking about Adam, one man. Disobedience, his one act of disobedience and all of creation fell, all the animal world, all the plant world by his one act. Weeds start growing because of his one act of sin. All mankind fell. And you know what the Bible says? His sin become our sin. I hope you're here for three hours tonight. For by one man's disobedience were many made sinners. How were men made sinners? By one man's disobedience. All fell, all of mankind. But listen to the second part of this. So by the obedience of one man shall many be made righteous. How are you made righteous as a Christian? By your good deeds? No. By the righteousness of one. You are made righteous. How? By the obedience of one man. You became a sinner by the disobedience of one man. How do you become righteous then? By the obedience of one man. What was that obedience? Dying on the cross. One act of obedience. Son, will you go to the cross and die for all this people? Yes. Yes. Is there any other way, Father? No. Then I'll do it. So Christ, when he died on the cross, by one act of obedience, made many righteous. How was it done? By Christ's obedience on the cross. That's how you're made righteous. That's how you're brought into a right relationship with God. By that one act of obedience. Again in Romans 3.25. I told you I'm giving you a lot. Romans 3.25. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Notice the next sentence. To declare his righteousness. His, Christ's righteousness. His righteousness has to be declared. Let me read this again. You need to hear it. Whom God has set forth, he's setting forth Christ to be a propitiation, a mercy seat through faith. He's holding Jesus forth and saying, please believe in him. There's mercy to be found here. Mercy, forgiveness, grace, kindness, goodness, all here. I'm holding my son forth as a propitiation through faith, not works. Through faith, you believe this. You accept this. Through faith in his blood. What happens when you put faith in the blood? It says here to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. When you put faith in the blood, you know what happens? There's a declaration of his righteousness for your forgiveness. You can be forgiven of all your past sins unless his righteousness was declared. Christ. Perfect obedience, his righteousness, his righteousness becoming yours. Isaiah 53 and 11. We dealt with this. We touched on this in an earlier week. He, that is Christ. It's talking about the cross in Isaiah 53. He on the cross. It's giving you an insight into Christ on the cross. He shall see of the travail of his soul. And he shall be satisfied. He's on the cross. You know what he's saying? This travail of dying, of suffering, of bleeding on the cross. He's going to see. That's his travail. He's going to see the travail. He's like a mother giving birth. And it says he shall see the travail of his soul and he shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many? 
for he shall bear their iniquities. If he doesn't bear your iniquities, how, how is it all these false teachers are saying, oh yes, we get all the blessings from the cross. We're made righteous. We're forgiven. But he didn't bear our sin. He didn't take the wrath of God. They deny one half of this and they destroy it. If you take away him bearing our sins, then we don't get his righteousness. You destroy the gospel. But here you're saying on the cross, by a knowledge, you need a knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. You need him preached to you. You need to understand who he is. And you know what? When that knowledge of who Jesus is gets preached to you, you know what happens? My righteous servant, he's righteous on the cross. Not like Kenneth Copeland and Kenneth Hagen and Joyce Meyer and Benny Hinn all teach. You know what they all teach? He become a sinner on the cross. He become a serpent on the cross. His nature became sin. Not that he bore sin. It said he become a sinner. And that's why he had to go to hell and burn and suffer for three days. That's heresy. It's not the prosperity gospel is there worth teaching. It is this teaching that Christ had to suffer and he had to be born again. That's what they teach. What trash. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, for he, that is God, made him, that is Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin. He didn't know any sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Why did he bear our sin? Why did he suffer on the cross? Why did he die? Why were our sins placed on him? That you could become the righteousness of God in Christ. He bears your sin. He makes you righteous. You literally become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. By faith, you become not only righteous, you are the righteousness of God. This is remarkable saints of God. Have you sinned? Did you fail this week? Is the devil condemning you? He is the accuser of the brethren. And I'm not excusing sin. But I'm saying when you see this, you rise up to walk holy. You want to follow him. You want to serve him. Point five. We're at least going to get to point five. Maybe not point six. But listen, let me close on this. Imputed righteousness. So how does this happen? We have his righteousness. It's in the gospel. You're made the righteousness of God. How does it happen? Let me close with this vital truth. This is a very important truth in the Bible that I'm going to close on. Imputed righteousness. Don't get scared by that word. Don't get scared at all. It's very important. This word imputed. Okay. If you don't understand it, just... Hold your horses, hold on to it. I'm coming there. Do you know what that word imputed means? I'm going to explain. It's used 19 times throughout the book of Romans. 19 times. It's used 11 times in just one chapter. Chapter 4. 11 times. Now the Greek word, it's one Greek word used 19 times, 11 times in one chapter. In other words, chapter 4 is all about imputed righteousness. Imputed. Adam's sin being imputed to you. Do you know the Bible teaches that? That Adam's one act of disobedience was imputed to you. You go, hold on, I didn't do it. Oh, I know. But it's affected your life from the day you were born. It's imputed and reckoned to you. Adam's sin affecting every area of your life. And so we see this word imputed is very important. Sometimes it's translated reckoned, counted, or imputed. This is what it means. To put into one's account. If I take Adam's sin and impute it to Brother Jer, I'm saying, you're guilty of that. Oh, I didn't do it. Yes, but it's legally binding upon you. It's going to affect your whole life. You'll carry the responsibility, the consequences, the weight, the burden, everything. It's imputed to you. Adam's sin is imputed to the whole humankind. All of mankind has fallen. It's not just that sin came through the nature it was a broken covenant. 
Adam and Eve in the garden, you're standing on behalf of all mankind. You better get this right. Because if you don't, all of humanity are in trouble. I want you to see that truth because I want you to see the opposite. So this word imputed means to put into one's account, to credit to you. And I've used often the bank account. It's like me putting a million euros and it's not going to happen. So don't get your hopes up. It's like me putting a million euro into your bank account and you're in trouble and you're in debt. You're really in debt. And there's guys in this city after you and you can't pay your bills and you can't afford anything and you're scrimping and you're begging and you're hoping and you're praying. And then you take your card and you go to the wall and you check your bank account and there's a million euro. And this is a bad example. It's a poor example. It's, it's a rubbish example, but it's the best I can do. And you look and it goes a million euro. You go, I don't believe that, that's impossible. That would answer all my problems. I, I could sort everything out and still it's massive. Massive. That's nothing. You see, that's what the word impute means. It means now you take it into account. Now you calculate it up. You're thinking it's a bookkeeping term, a banking term used in the Greek world. It was a business word for transactions. In the business world, if I give you the million dollars or million pounds or million euros, it's a business transaction. I have given that to you. It's yours. You own it legally. That's what the word impute means. It means to consider it to be true. Think it to be true. But I'm talking about the righteousness of God. When you hear the real gospel, the righteousness of God gets imputed into your bank account spiritually. This is too, saints of God, get happy over it tonight. This is too much for most Christians to go. The perfect righteousness of God in Christ, his obedience. You know how God looked on the son and said, I'm well pleased with his obedience. Now it goes into your bank account. Do you realize if this truth grips you, you you're going to be a happy man. You'll skip home. I don't care what your problems are in your life. You're one of the richest people in this city tonight. You're, you're, you're eternally rich. You'll never suffer ruin and destruction and damnation. You know why? The righteousness of God has been imputed to you. When God looks on you, he said, I consider you righteous like Jesus Christ. I consider you rich with my righteousness. It's an activity of your mind. Saints of God, engage your mind tonight. It's a verb, it's a doing word. Put your mind, your brain into action. Study out this truth. Go back to it. Get on your knees, pray it through. This is a radical truth that in my bank account, imputed to me, it's imputed. Read Romans 4 when you go home and you read all about this. Saints of God, I'm going to stop because I've got so much good stuff to do here. We're going to have to continue next week. I don't want you to lose this. I want you to see this. I want to make you happy. If you're in sin, I want to make you sad. If you're a sinner, I want to make you envious. I want you to go and look at me and say, I'm so envious of him. Praise God to be forgiven, righteous, justified. God has reckoned me righteous. And when you read through Romans chapter 4, 11 times this word imputed, reckoned, to account is used in a remarkable way. You know why? God wants you to see that his righteousness, the righteousness of God, it comes to you through faith. Oh, but I didn't earn it. I know you didn't. But, I, but Brother Keith, I don't deserve this. I know you don't. I, in an entire, if you lived a thousand years, you could not earn this. You could not work for it. You could not build up your bank account like this. You know why? Because it came the first day you were born again. The first day you got saved. God says, I reckon your faith to be my righteousness. And it's over. It's not a little bit of righteousness. It's not just topping up your bank account. It's not just paying off all of your bills or a few of your bills. This is so massive. Saints of God, this covers you eternally. 
And you know what it is? It's a robe of righteousness. This is the robe you wanted the marriage feast. I want to tell you. This is the robe that Jonathan gave to David. This is the robe that Jesus Christ gave to you as a free gift, as an act of faith. Have you believed on Jesus? You may not have understood this until tonight. That's okay. But do you know what? Did you put faith in Jesus? Did you believe him? Did you put faith in what he done on the cross? Did you ask him to forgive you? Did you ask him, did you submit to him? Do you know what happened that day? Why do you think you felt forgiven and felt clean and felt like you're in a right relationship with God? And sometimes something happens and you go, I don't feel right with God. Will you do me a favor? Will you go home? Stick your spiritual card in the wall and check the bank account. Go check. Has it been stolen? Have you used up all the credit? Are, are, are you there scrimping around like some beggar, hoping that you'll make it through? And yet you've got this mass of perfect righteousness that fills eternity. And it'll last eternally. And it's given free by grace, through faith, because of what Jesus done on the cross. He bore your sin. Now his righteousness is imputed to you. Your sin was imputed to him on the cross. And he died in your place. And the exchange was made. His righteousness was given to you freely. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, we praise you. We worship you. We love you. Lord God, I thank you for this remarkable truth. It's such a central truth. It's a fundamental truth. As we have looked at penal substitution, this is the blessing of it. This is the very heart of it. This is the reason for it. It wasn't in vain that Christ bare our sin. It wasn't in vain that Christ experienced the wrath of his heavenly father. It wasn't some game plan. But oh God, he bore our sin at Calvary. He carried our sins far away. Our sins were laid upon him. That his righteousness, his perfect spotless righteousness... His obedience might be transferred to us, making us right. And my God, this is the foundation of our salvation. This is the act that saved us and made us right with God and made us accepted in the beloved. And my God, we are perfect in your sight through the free gift of Jesus. We love you tonight. We bless you. And I pray tonight, everyone here in this, that you'd set them free from guilt, from condemnation, from fear, from doubt, from uncertainty. My God, lift up their heads, lift up their eyes. Grant them knowledge that they might be free, justified, living by faith, justified by faith, and then walking on to walk with you on the foundation of this free gift. Bless us tonight in Jesus' mighty name.